Hello and welcome to episode 7 of the eLearning Unlocked podcast. I'm Jill Chester, the founder of Little Man Project. We're a bespoke development company that specializes in developing learning experiences for charities and the third sector. This podcast runs alongside our eLearning Unlocked blended learning program. This program supports learning and development professionals in charities to design effective e-learning for their staff and volunteers. In this seventh episode, I'm going to be talking to Amy Hansen from Euromonitor International about how she has embraced and integrated AI into her daily activities as their Director of Talent Management. So today I'm joined by Amy Hansen. Amy and I first met on a webinar actually around uh, the topic of AI run by the Learning Network and the team at Quantum Rise. Uh, and I was just really interested, Amy is using AI a lot and has really embedded it in her activities, you know, day to day. So I was just really keen to have a conversation with somebody who seems to have just embraced the practice of using AI in lots of different ways. So Amy, would you mind introducing yourself and just saying a little bit about what you do and where you work? Sure. Thanks, Jill. Yes, Amy Hansen. I'm currently Director of Talent Management is my official title at a company called Euromonitor International and we do data analytics on market research. I have been there for just over a year and my role encompasses all talent management activities as well as learning and development. So we do performance, succession, talent reviews, as well as the L&D side of things. So it's quite a broad remit and we have 16 global offices with a headcount of about 1,400 people at the moment, I think. So yeah, one year in. Wow. So a lot of scope and a lot of people <laughs> and Cheers. international. Wow. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, okay, so just to kind of, you know, get started, what really kicked off, you know, what sparked your interest in AI and particularly in being quite a fast adopter when I talk to other yeah, people yeah. who are not so... yeah. I think it's quite interesting if I think back over, we've been talking about the introduction of mobile phones this week at work and I'm aging myself massively here. I'm never a first adopter of technologies as they come out, but I am an early adopter. I've got, I think my mother would call it natural nosiness, curiosity is what I now prefer to call it in just what happens. Like what if you try something? And I guess AI in terms of what we're talking about here today is more on the large language models and the chat GPT type things and what you can do. That really got peaked early last year, maybe. So before I joined this role, and actually it was my husband who tried it out first. And then we had, um, my little one was in the bath and wanted a story about a fairy called, I don't know, Matilda or something. And I thought, I'm going to try this because he'd show me what it can do. And I was just in mum mode. I was like, oh, give me a two minute story for a three-year-old about a fairy living in the woods called Matilda. And it was there and I was the best mum in the world at that moment and I was like this is interesting and then from there like my role changed and just the curiosity and the opportunity to try different things evolved I also then had the curiosity I was like you know I, I need to get ahead of this if we're going to see how the organization can use it and how we can support that so I did a very brief course specific one specific to L&D and one more of a generic, how do you use, it was a chat GPT specific course. And I came away from that with my little mind blown, but understanding way more. And it's it's curiosity, but also necessity. If you close your eyes to this, you are going to get left behind. I don't think it will take jobs, but it you need to know how to integrate this. And being in the role I do, I'm always fascinated with how we can move things forward, the way we learn, the way we grow, how we work. We all spend a lot of time at work. And if we can make that better in some way, then I'm that's why I do what I do. Technology now forms a huge part of that. And LLMs is just the next step in that technology evolution from mobile phones when I didn't have one when I went to university. And I learned to do training by writing, handwriting on acetates. And that really ages me, you know, carrying around a flip chart in my backpack with pens to, to the way we're doing things. Now it's just so vastly different. So you have to do it. The opportunity is huge, but it can be quite scary too. But also exciting. and Hugely exciting. Yeah. And the possibility, you know, like you demonstrated the possibility straight away with, you know, the writing the story. That's, that's, the, that's what's available to us if we, you know, in terms of creativity and not just kind of administrative. Okay. So how are you using it on a day-to-day -day basis? Because I know it's day-to-day. It is day to day. How, how are you using it? What are you doing? And how do you approach, you know, is it AI first? Is that now become kind of 
your first point of call or or is it just you start things and then just anyway you tell us <laughs> it I think it depends on what I'm doing the day I'm having interesting I had some time off and I hardly used an LLM at all it's on my phone I have multiple different apps that you can use you know specifically just the LLM ones I have um chat GPT is my go-to and then copilot is my second the copilot has a bit more of the the open functionality in terms of image generation that's not behind a paywall yeah. that you need to pay for with chat GPT so it's a variety of ways and it's just to the biggest thing that I need to remember when I'm using is that I'm not an expert and that really helps with some of the frustrations you can get when it doesn't give you what you want it to first time. Like, Come on, I've asked you for something and it doesn't give you that. But for me, there's something around in, in the workplace, particularly around rapid idea generation. Like I don't have to have someone sitting in front of me or being a room full of people where we've got post-it notes and we're talking and I'm getting distracted, which can happen quite a lot with the ideas. But just to say, I want to try this out and set it out. It challenges my assumptions back. So I call it, I start off with my little pocket buddy. But it's a go-to. It's like, well, I'm thinking about this. If you were this person, how would you respond to that? And so that persona element, when you're particularly in hybrid working environments or remote working yeah. environments, is really useful to say, assume the role of a CFO and review this business case that I've just put together. That's really helpful and pulls out bits that I don't naturally think about communication and in an LED design perspective tone of voice critical your clarity particularly when you're dealing with global audiences and English is a second language we need to be really mindful of how we're communicating things and helping people learn that's really important I can't do that I've grown up speaking really quickly and in English it's not something natural for me to resort to but I'm really mindful of my audience so if I, I actually maintain a piece of text that is my tone of voice and our company tone of voice as an example. So when I'm asking it to write something, I take the time to write a prompt, but I'll take that text, put it in and say, use this as your style guide. There's very few things I would have to change on that now, but that's taken months of refinement to tweak different things and, and things like that. So communications and design is brilliant. The persona thing, but also just doing research. Like I don't, the days of Googling and actually reading stuff and going through and doing that side-by-side -side comparison of things, you don't need to do that anymore. In turn, turn, the output is the same. So you'd still write down all of that stuff pre-LLM and then you'd still do the analysis bit. You can just generate a lot of that text now for you to do that side-by-side -side comparison. The, the most difficult thing I think with this is learning how to prompt in a way that works for you so that you get the outputs you're looking for one-liners are not going to give you the depth of answer that you're looking for. So understanding that and how to use different styles of prompting is really critical as well. But yes, it is daily. I very I don't really use it personally anymore. It's more it is definitely more a work thing for me. And I think that's indicative of how much I use it. I now don't want to use it at home. Like that's a work thing. So it's my switch off is actually, you no, know, we'll go back to reading the books and turning the pages, um, which is obviously what you do with the one, but it it's an interesting shift that I noticed. Previously, I was doing both way more. Now I'm in depths of it during the working day. I probably use it less personally because that's a switch off for me. Yeah, no, that is really interesting. I wanted to jump back to something you said, but I it didn't really even occur to me to use it personally. You know, lots of yeah. workshops you go to, people say, "Oh, you know, for recipe," you know, look, and I, I it just never, it never enters my head. Um, we have we're on, going on a holiday next week, and we've done a few things where we've referenced, and particularly just research like what films can we watch about where we're going, and you know those sorts of things. Anyway, I wanted to jump back to you in terms of the tone of voice. I think that's really interesting. So, how do you go about refining that? You know, what what was wrong yeah. with the first iteration? What did you need to do? Yeah, so. You, you, because because the large language model is is trained to talk to, back to you like you talk to it, so it 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 learns from every conversation that you put into it. So if you go between one chat it and just keep going down there, it will re remember and it will learn from the style that you're using within that chat. If you go between different chats, so you start a new one, it's totally fresh, it's totally new. So you need to tell the model each time you're using it how you want it to respond. Now if I think even in, pre in free versions, you can still do your custom instructions. And I'm going to talk chat GPT here because it's the one I know the best. Um, you can have custom instructions there. It says, what do you want 
me to know about you. So you can put in your job title, the type of people that you're you're talking to. So my global audience is, please remember that it's English as a second language for majority of my stakeholders. Please remember that I don't like you to write in US English. I want S's, not Z's. And it's it might, the workshop I went on really taught me how to play with that. I was getting really bored with fluffy answers the other day. So is it the, there's a smart brevity or something approach? I can't remember the actual words. Smart brevity approach. So I put that into my custom instructions <laughs> and is now out because all I was getting back was one line answers because I was trying to cut out some of that stuff. So I have a intense dislike of the words fostering and cultivating you know, transformative cultures. And you can see the AI language coming through in the stuff we're reading now. Um, You can put in there, please don't use the word cultivate. Please don't use the word foster. But in terms, it's it's just not enough. So in a chat, when I'm really going hard on, I want to develop an e-learning script or I want to write an email from one of my stakeholders that they can use to send out to the rest of their organization, I have, in, I, you can get text and say, this is one of their previous emails. Make sure there's no sensitive information in it. Give it and then take time to say, this is what I want to communicate. I want people to go away and know X, Y, Z and that they need to do X, Y, Z with the tone of voice and that. And it takes time. It's not like, you know, just write me a communication to introduce X. You have to take time, but it does it. And then when you read it, you go, does that work? Does it not? So that human mm-hmm. oversight and it doesn't take away that every single person in the workplace from entry level coming out of school all the way through will need to have that oversight. So you still need to learn that, but it takes time to go, yes, that sounds like my stakeholder or like me, or does that meet these learning objectives? Um, But you only get that by practicing with it. And I think that's where a lot of people are just like, oh, I don't want to, I'm scared. I can just do it myself. You can, but once you start practicing, I can guarantee you will get quicker. So it is that natural, it's almost like that childlike curiosity is don't assume you're an expert and just keep trying stuff because what works for you, Jill, will be very different than what works for me. The same as the way that you would build an e-learning course is very different than the way that I would go about building it. There's loads of techniques out there you can do with instructional design or workshop design, how you do a briefing session, totally an individual, but we can all get quicker at it by using the tool in a way that works for us. It takes time yeah. though. Yeah, no, and that's that's great because I think a lot of people are using it for idea generation and in- kind of testing out ideas and, and research. But I love that you're using it much more, you know, for that, but also actual practical. I, I've taught I've taught you how to talk like me. So now yeah. I need this talk like me. And, yeah. you know, that 20, 30 minutes sitting in front of an email trying to craft it beautifully is it's gone away it it's reduced it not gone away you're right it, it's, it's reduced it yeah in terms of kind of particular successes that you might have had things that really st- struck you know like what what's the area you think it's really benefiting you um and you know you have a team what what are you doing in terms of the work that they're doing as well the team thing is a really interesting one and you, you sent me through the questions and the conversation topic for today and i think one of the most successful things that I try and do with the team is actually we have prompting challenges. So if we're having a meeting, we want to refine our mentoring programs, one of the initiatives we're working on. The one that exists has been around for a while. No one really knows about it. What's the purpose of it? So everyone knows what mentoring is, but what do we want our mentoring program to be? So we did, we we locked ourselves in a room and rather than the post-it notes and flip charts where we go, well, this is what we know and following that change process through, I wrote, right, prompt challenge. Let's see who can come up with the most Euro monitor phrase of why this mentoring program exists. Now you could just ask it that and it would search the internet, find our company page and give us something back. But what we know is how we talk internally. We know what our stakeholders are looking for. So we both sat there and it's interesting. And she, when my, she, she pressed enter. So she'd finished her prompt and she looked at me and I'm still typing away on my prompts because we prompt differently. Mine are quite in depth, but then we came out and it's like, actually, we got 10 different examples of stuff we could use. And in the end, I think we mashed three of them together to make it right. That would have taken, that would have taken us the half an hour you've just mentioned just to come up with three attempts at what a sentence could be. The, the model, the technology that doesn't need that thinking time and it doesn't get distracted by so-and-so walking past or the coffee, you know, it's, 
it's instantaneous and it's really satisfying. But those prompting challenges are brilliant. Just go and try it, I keep saying. So another email I received yesterday was, I just chat gpt this. I haven't reviewed it, um, but I think it's pretty close because I spent ages writing my prompt. That's brilliant. I don't want people to hide that from me because this is coming. So when I love it when they come to me and say, yeah, I've tried it. So it's improving efficiency. I think it it helps creativity. I don't think it is creative. The creativity comes from how you ask it to respond to you. It's only as good as the prompts you put in. So that's where the learning needs to come. And that contextual piece of how do you put the right information in to get the right answers back that you want. I also love playing around with it for image generation. You need a paid version on ChatGPT for that, but you don't on Copilot. So I just hit one year anniversary and I got a little Playmation Wallace and Gromit version of me on LinkedIn. That was done by ChatGPT conveniently. So there's different ways you can use it. The other the, the other successes, I guess, which was your question is business case comparison. I needed to do a side-by-side -side of three platforms on functionality for our leadership team. I didn't ask, I didn't want to go away and do the research. I've got all of the documentation from the companies. It's all publicly available. So I gave the parameters of, I want to talk about this, 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 and this, put it in this format, please do it like this. And then I can get that back out. I saved myself at least a day's work by taking the time to do it carefully and Yes, I refined it once it had come out, um, but that was, it blows my mind how long that would have taken me pre mm. LLM mm. to what I got this week. Um, and then I guess the the final success is just, it's just trying it and seeing other people try it. Whether that's me, whether it's someone else, I built my own GPTs, like we were trying to do performance and you know now I know how to do that, slightly geeking out, is it's really hard to write smart goals if you don't know what smart goals are and you've got quite a transactional role, right? So we'll put it in and it, whether you built your own GPT, it can help you do some of those fundamental things that we're asking managers and employees to do that are difficult. They, this is not their world. So helping other people do it, but you can build GPTs that literally will guide someone through those processes that you're trying to upskill them in. It can act as a coach. You don't need me to build your GPT. You just need to tell the model to act as a coach and don't put any sensitive information in there. That's that's success. So seeing other people try it is the real success. And I think we're getting there. So interesting. So w would you say you were an early adopter within the organization as well? Yes. I think like you, you mentioned, Jill, is you, there's so many webinars and this is front and center. I mean, definitely on my algorithm on LinkedIn, right? But again, it's an AI algorithm. It's yeah. taking what I look at this is everywhere but even people who work in tech when we were talking about the objective setting i'm like you people are product owners sitting in a tech park at my organization if you're asking me for help i hope you have asked a model before you've asked me and the answer was no because people just aren't making the link that this can be used for anything and everything so whilst you have someone in a job you'll go and ask the person that you know which is fundamentally right in an organization we should be building those human connections but do some research first, and like I, it's like, yeah, your tech people mm -hmm. go use tech, um, mm -hmm. use use the tools that are available to you. So yes, I still am one of the early adopters, and I think probably, and I don't know because I don't obviously know our fourteen hundred people. There are people out there that obviously know way more than we, and we're doing this in our in our products as well. Like there's an AI feature within our product, so you can ask it questions, and it will give you answers based on our research. But from a just using it, I don't need transcripts. That's not part of my day. I don't need it to summarize my meetings. That's not that beneficial to me. But for output, it's really useful. So yeah, I'm still, and I would say I'm still an early adopter in how much and how often and how I use it. So do you think that, um, I'm going off piece now. Uh, do you think that learning and development as a function has a role to play in training people how to use it and i i mean training in a very small yeah. you know like just the 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 you know some of the things you've learned around prompting and you know there, there's some key things um and we'll talk about policy in a minute but do you think that that you know taking that active role as an lnd professional to encourage others and you know support them to improve is a you know part of your role i suppose is 
I think it's everyone's role within an organization because this is it, like it's just happening. Whether you are in an L&D role, whether you are in a finance role, there is stuff that an LLM can do for you that is, is better and it makes work better and easier. So everyone has a responsibility. I do think that within the talent space, we have a role to play to create a safe environment and help the business create a safe environment for people to test stuff out. That obviously goes in hand in hand with your tech teams, whether it's enterprise tech or customer tech. Um, it's it's a true partnership, but the space of learning and growing in your career has traditionally always been L and D. Um, this has shifted the dial significantly on what that looks like. You don't need to do all of the models. You don't need to know how to do instructional design techniques, right? You don't need to know Addy anymore. You can say act as an instructional designer and write me a two minute script on introducing LLMs to an organization. Yeah. It will do it for you. And it's pretty close. Um, so yes, you we do have a role to play, but one of the biggest things I think is communication and encouragement and creating that space and some, some guidelines on the parameters of when to use it and how to use it. And that's the toughest thing because the opportunities are endless. And unless you have that defined objective and clear purpose, you're either going to get overwhelmed or just it's not going to give you what you want. So you need to know the purpose of why you're going there in the first place to use it. And yes, that does fall within our remit, but I think it also falls in the remit of the organization to communicate how and what. Some will have a greater risk appetite for that than other organizations. We very much invested heavily early on in the customer facing, but almost forgot about us. And you can't forget about us because people are doing it anyway. So, you know, the crazy people out there like me, you're not going to stop me. Um, so we need to harness that and help people share it more because it's here to stay. Um, and the iterations are fast, fast and exciting, but also just overwhelming. So kind of talking about the mitigating of risk and policy, bleh, boring. You, you've had a policy within the organisation, I understand, before you came. So that does make them reasonably forward thinking because, you know, there's lots of organisations that still don't have policies right now. I know that there are problems with policies in the sense of they don't, they can't keep up. But what are the key components of yours? Do you think that they're useful, supportive, yeah, I mean, we're market research, right? So our, our knowledge is our power and what we sell. So we needed, I guess, but, and again, it was before I joined. So I walked into it. It's a very simple policy. The tech and the advancements in this, I mean, even for when I joined, you can't keep up with the pace and policies can't keep up with that. So I think if you're talking policies, it has to be to mitigate risk. And there are basic parameters that apply around the use of any tech, like it's why organizations say you can't access your personal email on your work device and different things like that. It's basic security measures. So it's essentially saying, don't do anything that you shouldn't do, which is put our data into a public model, because as soon as you put data in there, it becomes public. Intellectual property is obviously our business. So we don't want people putting any of our research in there. Um, we can't stop our clients doing it, interestingly. So, you know, there's a risk attached to all of this and how you do those sorts of things. But it basically says, don't be silly. Don't put sensitive information in there. Don't make our company identifiable. And if you're not sure, ask or just don't do it. It it literally is that simple because if you go broader than that and try and be specific, it's going to be out of date. But just your basic ethics on how you should use a tool to support you in your work do become the, the ways in which you work. Um, as we go forward and in integrating enterprise licensing, there are obviously different things that need to factor in and that's where I kind of go in <laughs> tech. Then uh, yes. policy teams need to take over on that because yes, I'm an early adopter and I love it, but I don't know what it can, I don't know the depths of what it can do and I don't want to know that tech side of it. Um, really? So yeah, policy, be sensible. I mean, but also that's such a tangible thing that people can get on with, you know, that yeah. the, I think when you, when, people are overthinking it and that's why they're not doing it um so i think that's a really great advice just get yeah. on with something that just makes it clear um and you know if you're following um data protection regulations in general you kind of know what that means it's just you're thinking less about people information and more about the organization information yeah. or as yeah. well um and then if you treat those two things as you would normally treat just 
personal information, then yeah, you need to. Um, but I think it's also just about communicating that really fundamental fact that if you put data into it, it gets sucked in and kept. So be really mindful of what you're putting in. Um, but yes, it's, it's an interesting one because I always wonder about, um, you know, I today as a supplier, I've not, not been asked by a customer to sign anything that says I won't put their content into. Um, and similarly, yeah. you're on the reverse of that, of clients taking your data and yeah, yeah which I what? mean, it must be coming. Um, and, uh, and we're maybe, really mindful of it because we're already thinking of it from a GDPR, you know, in that same yeah. mindset set of I wouldn't, I wouldn't put a you know list of users onto a uh, you know out into yeah. the public domain, so I'm not going to put their intellectual property either. Yeah, and it's I had a conversation, it's obviously charity sector as well, with one of my friends who works in the charity sector in education and uh, helping people with coming out of education. Is, you know, you know the parameters of your business and what is sensitive information and what's not. I don't know that for those, you know, other businesses. Um, but within your organization, you would hope that that's pretty obvious. And I think that's the basis of that you need to base any policy on is fundamentally, how do you keep the ethics and the integrity of your company alive? So whether your suppliers are asking you to do it as a supplier, you would have your own policy internally saying, we will not put <laughs> customer information into a large language model because that's the right thing to do and it will generate you business um so those those sensible things are totally realistic and most people in any organization will get that over complicating it and not talking about it is a greater risk because if you don't talk about it then you're not addressing some of the issues which are just fundamental be sensible and if you you know you don't want people to do it with their data don't do it with their data and vice versa it's it's that fast you can't do anything other than that I don't think at the moment unless you are in the depths of doing the actual development of these tools and then it's different yeah yeah no absolutely um okay so just kind of moving on um we've talked around the kind of the prompts that you use and you know I I absolutely took one of your ideas away and applied it to my own um use um in terms of um you know, loading more information, background information. I just sort of told it I worked in the charity sector and I was in the UK. Yeah. And um, but I took some of your advice around kind of plain English and 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 seen a massive improvement in the output. Yeah. Um, a lot less of me having to edit things. You know, I used to have to do a lot of editing. Yeah. But what? So what are your tips um, that you know you would say to people um, getting started? Um, you know, either kind of how you, what you can do but also like how you can do it well i'm going to take it to the work contest i think the examples of using it for your personal life are great so we're taking a four-year-old to london because it's coming to the end of summer holidays tomorrow so we have a route planned and yes chat gpt help you plan my route <laughs> and then, you know uh, what time we're we getting here and stuff roughly how long would it take and i don't need to sit and work all that out so i think the personal cases are easy because a lot of it isn't sensitive information and you, you're kind of quite happy to be given something when it comes to work, I think that thing around having a clear purpose, knowing what you want to get out of it is is really key because the opportunities are so vast. Um, and start with something simple. So if even if it is the email generation is the easiest example I can think of. Say, I want to send an email to someone and I want these to be the key points. This is the context. See what you get back, but you have to, one, you have to have that curiosity. So in a week when you, you know, if you're listening to this or you see something else on AI, you think, oh, I wonder, do it then. Because if you don't, it will go away and that thought process will go. So clear purpose and just have the curiosity to try and you're going to have to iterate. There is not one person on this planet that gets something right first time unless it's by pure chance. And if you do, next time it's probably not going to go yes, so well. Yes. So it's the same thing with how you experiment with this, same thing as how you learn to drive, how you learn to draw how you learn to walk there are errors in all of those things so maybe it is having a young way it's not I'm, I'm always like crazy curious person but just try because you will never know until you try but go with intent um your prompts and using them thoughtfully is you know ask the model how to write a great prompt if if you want to know how to do something take the time to put it in there I mean you can spend a good if you're doing something detailed I'll probably write the prompt for about 10 minutes, walk away, come back, have a look at it, and then try again to see if it does what I want it to do. 
and then see what happens. If you don't like it, you can either edit it and it will regenerate your answer. Or you can say, you're really close. Could you please add in these three things? Or what about this? It's really good at challenging your perspective. So once you've got something, ask it to do something else. A really, really silly example from last week is someone hadn't used it for image generation. So I got him on Copilot and I said, well, what do you want to, you know, type in there, please create me an image of, and he wrote a mango tree. I don't know where, (laughs) a mango tree. I said, okay, so now you've got your mango tree, ask it to add something else into the picture. And so he ended up with a mango tree with a pig in front of it. Don't know where that brain process came from, but that's what he ended up with. And he'd never even thought that it could do that. I'm like, so not necessarily in his field of work, but that's a really yeah, fun thing to yeah. know. So if it can do that, what else can it do? And how else could you think that something that you're not even sure? And if you're not sure, ask it and it will tell you if it can do it or not. Yeah. Um, and so the, the intent to play with curiosity but setting your purpose is where I think people need to start and just accept you're going to get it wrong and it takes a bit of time, like learning any new skill. Yeah, and I definitely I, I, I definitely find one of my big things that I used to use it for, and I, I find myself, because I think your prompts have helped me improve what I, the output, but what I found was it was, all, it was just like talking out loud in a way. You know, I would, I would, I would, by writing the prompts you're articulating your own thoughts yeah and then it's coming back and then that's making you reflect on what you've said so I would often find that even when I wasn't very good at my prompts and even when I wasn't getting the answers I wanted I created the answers by the conversation that I was having so it might not say the right thing but it might spark a new idea and then I would say oh you're right could I do this and um, (laughs) so I think you know building what you've said I think don't underestimate that just starting and yes the first answer might not be right but just keep going just keep having those conversations because you will find benefit in it and then yes as I develop my skills that's when I started to get much better quality output out of it um I think there's something around uh uh, certainly, you know, this is my business. I don't have anyone above me to ask the questions that I, I mean, I do have my team. They're amazing. But I love having that, you know, I, I asked it for a coaching plan. And yes, you know, there's, but I think, the, you know, I, I always think of it because that's my position and I don't have anyone above. But you're right. Everyone should be able to just do this and, and use that as their first port of call before they then go somewhere else to, you know, take that with, you know, this is, this is what I've created as a coaching plan. What's your feedback? You know, could you support me? Do you think there's better things I could do? Um, mm-hmm. So yeah, I think that's really interesting. So in terms of the future, as we come to a close, yeah. what do you think the future is? Do you think that there, I mean, I obviously I'm seeing, uh, you know, um, Articulate Rise of, I saw a note today on LinkedIn about their new one coming. I've seen it in action. Um, you know, is there anything you've seen? Because our algorithm obviously now knows you. Yeah. Um, you know what? What do you? What's your observations about what you think's next? It's in the L and D space. It's really interesting. I think the recruitment space is, is probably got a little bit further in the L and D space because there's really obvious ways that you can get transcripts and you can use it to do the analysis of what people said to remove bias. I think there are some of those lessons we can take into L and D. Um, we all come with bias and therefore the models have been trained by humans come with bias so it's really important to remember that when you're trying to think about how we communicate to broad audiences um what's what's coming i don't know um i'm quite happy playing where we're playing at the moment and and it is playing um yeah so you can see that some of the platforms are integrating some ai design tools we we use um I say we use the team. I've learned how to use it. So I'm very proud of myself is to do video editing and they have one, it's an overlord or something in Descript. I don't know what it is, but you put it in and it will will basically tell you something. Um, But they're all in really early versions of tests and you need to put in, for that to work, those teams have spent hours plugging in how to do instructional design into that model. So just trying to do instructional design through something like a free co-pilot or chat GPT isn't going to work. 
So yes, companies are doing it, but I also think that if you get, I mean, I'm not a first adopter. I'm not in anywhere near my 30s anymore, sadly, right? So there are people who are going to get this quicker than me, the tech natives. But it's it's exciting and it's fun. I think you should try and play with it because it's coming and you can use it in your role. The people whose jobs it's going to take are the ones who go, no, I don't want to see this. Um, But in our role as learning and in the talent profession as a whole, whether it's performance or not, it was just like our, our rating scale. I was like, it doesn't feel like we know we've had feedback, it's new. I wanted to make it feel more human. I said, what can we do with this? This is how, and you know, it's in that we know how it talks. So you can just use it to do different things. So what's coming is more, I think. It will enable a workforce to get there quicker than we as L&D functions can give it to them. So our role shifts is how do we become the real enablers? And this, I, I listened to a meet the author this week from um, Philippa White, who wrote Return on Humanity. And it's to, to get change, you need to viscerally feel something. You can't say go back to the human qualities of empathy and kindness because we know that feeling good means you deliver more for organizations that grows economies that helps the world so the whole cycle is is coming through but you need that human element and this can only accelerate it if it's used in the right way it doesn't destroy it and i think that's a misconception we need to get over but also don't just take what it gives you and shove it into a Know, video editing and ask an AI voice to read it because that's not going to make the difference. So you still need to hit people and make people feel to grow and learn. That becomes our role more than some of the content generation and curation that we used to do. But if L and D and HR don't change the way that we operate, the business will leave us behind because they will find their own ways to do it using tools that we haven't caught up with. I think. Ah. Oh. I knew I would enjoy this conversation. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. I wanted to ask more questions, but I just want to end on that because I just think that is, uh, it's a call to action for l and I think it's really powerful and I 100% agree with it. And so I want to finish there because I, people go away and try. And yes, yeah. I really agree with you that we should lead the way because if we don't, um, we will get left behind. But we'll also... We won't get the benefit because we know that we can do this in a supportive way that enables rather than detracts. Yeah. Um, so yeah, one hundred percent. Thank you so much. Really, really You're enjoyed welcome. that. Thank you for the opportunity. Lovely. Thanks again. Just before we finish, if you're a regular listener, you may have noticed a bit of a difference in this episode's introduction. In a bit of a meta moment, the introduction and this outro were recorded using the AI tool Eleven Labs and an AI version of Jill's voice. 